Hello everyone, I'm Annie Gibbons and you're listening to Memoirs of Successful Women, the podcast where you get to hear candid conversations with fascinating women from around the globe who share aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure their success and what they have learnt along the way. Hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. Today I am introducing you to Dr. Laura Cobb, who's a nationally certified and licensed professional counsellor, life coach, international motivational speaker and international best-selling author. We're going to be talking about leveraging the power of your voice. And that's exactly the area that Linda specializes in. She's committed to empowering ambitious professional women like you with tools and strategies to prevent self-sabotage so that you can courageously suit up and show up And then you can then step up and speak up to share your message, whether it's in the boardroom, conference room, classroom, bedroom, wherever you are, uh, she's going to give you the tools in how you can become your best self in that way. So I look forward to hearing your story today. Welcome to the program, Laura. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited to know you better and so that I can share my story to best serve your audience. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm fascinated by your story because it comes from a real driver of of hardship, you know, and I'd love you to tell the listeners the the preface, you know, you've gone on to get a PhD in child studies and you're an expert in the area of family studies, but I know uh, that's driven out of a a challenging, if we like, say, uh, childhood. And so how about we, we start you sharing with, you know, what was your childhood like and why has that become your, your passion, if you like, your, your power to make things better for women moving forward? My childhood, essentially, I felt like a leftover. Mm. I felt like I didn't fit in only to the extent that my siblings, my sister and my brother, one brother bullied me viciously, my mom used the words, and um, my other brother bullied me in ways of which people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. And I often wondered, even into young adulthood and into where I was at about, I'd say maybe seven years ago, excuse me, that I always wondered if they knew. And when I asked them when I was younger about my brother and my sister, the verbal and the physical bullying is if if they knew why did they do anything and if they didn't know, why weren't they around to do or say anything? Hmm. And uh, I often felt like I didn't have a voice. It felt like I was literally the redheaded stepchild, although I had braces and glasses and freckles and being called fat and ugly for years by my sister, who was the popular one and the cheerleader and the, the prom queen. And that, that um, I just felt kind of like a leftover that I didn't have a space and I didn't know my place. So I had to find the grace to carve my own niche, so to speak. And that happened when I went to college. Um, so like even, even in high school, I wasn't particularly an exceptional student. I was one such that I got by. Nobody actually knew what was going on. I would come home from school and um, I would come home from even the night out from during the week with my friends and nobody asked how I was. I would go into my bedroom and I would cry and I would wonder why was I crying? Why was I so upset and unhappy? And I wasn't necessarily alone, but just so deeply lonely. Mm. Um, I mean, the color of my skin, Again, and where I lived in the world that some might say I was definitely privileged. Although I thought we were, uh, we were rich. My mom said, no, cause we were on food stamps and welfare. And I didn't know it at the time. I did feel like we, I had everything that I needed. Mm. It's just the wanting. And as a child, I didn't know the difference between wanting and needing. I thought what I needed was what I wanted. Yes. And as I grew, I didn't find what I needed. I think there's so many people that are going to be resonating with exactly the essence of what you're sharing that, You just feel invisible. You feel invisible in this world of, but this is my family. Why don't people see me? Why don't they recognize me? And also, why don't they do that one simple thing of stepping out and asking, are you okay? Or um, or show that they believe you or show that they're interested in you. There's There's a fine line, isn't it, of just going through life 
and being okay and then realizing, but what is that extra step? What is that one? And which doesn't seem like a big step, does it? No, it doesn't seem like a big step. Although with a with a, a child, they're only they only have a few years of reference, and as a young adult, you only have a certain more years of reference. But then the ego is still. It's all about them oneself, myself, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, just uh, not not sensing that I had a voice. There's a quote by Toni Morrison that resonates with me deeply. And it, she says, uh, when your children walk in the room, do your eyes light up? Hmm. And her, her point of reference is that parents or adults are concerned so much about the way that, that um, children look and are their buttons buttoned, are their zippers zipped up and are their shoes tied? I didn't necessarily care about that. I just wanted to know whether or not they saw me when I walked into the room. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm my, I have three older biological siblings and two older step-siblings and being the youngest, that um, kind of like an afterthought. Although my sister told me as an adult, she said, and we discussed it, how, how I felt and how she felt about me growing up is that I was a threat. And that's really what bullying is about. It's about feeling threatened and lacking or sensing that there's a perception of some semblance of power. So what happened was I didn't feel like I had any power. So then I became a bully mm. at school. Mm. This was in grammar school. And um, I, luckily I found the, the women, thank goodness for social media, only to the extent that I was able to find the women that I bullied and um, was able to make my amends. Wow. And that, that felt good. But it was so, it was so humbling at the time going, saying, thinking to myself, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? And what will be said to me? And in hindsight, it wasn't about that at all. It was about relieving myself of the, of the burden of self. Yeah, exactly. Wow. wow, what an opportunity to be able to make that amends. You know, I think that's an amazing, amazing thing to do. And, and I can imagine it's life-changing because it just releases that burden of things that you may not have been proud of, right? Um, yeah. Allows that and, and even, Sorry. Even the, things, even the things that I wasn't proud of, I was still sitting with so many things. Hmm. that it wasn't necessarily about the bully. It was just not feeling good in my skin hmm. or feeling comfortable that I was never enough. I wasn't the pretty one. I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't smart enough. I was never smart enough. Um, I wasn't rich enough. I, I, actually, the, the, the money part didn't really come into to play. It's um, a lot of what sits with me now, and it doesn't sit with me. A lot of a lot of the insight that I have now is um, based on the work of Brene Brown, mm. and there's a difference between shame versus guilt. Mm. And so much of my life was sitting in shame, and then it was it was um, not even it wasn't even a juxtaposition between that and the guilt. The shame encouraged the behavior as I um, increased in age. Uh, what I was doing was was based on the shame that I felt about myself. <laughs> it was so hard to tease those two, two apart. Mm. So tough, but it's necessary in order to, to know that I'm I'm enough. My behavior might not be appropriate at all, but I'm still worthy of love and respect and honor. Absolutely. It's a lifelong lesson, isn't it? That everyone mm -hmm. is worthy of love, respect mm -hmm. and honor. Everyone is enough just by being themselves. Everybody is you know, beautiful enough, capable enough, smart enough, you know, look at you, you've gone on to be doing a PhD and, and the language is still, you know, I wasn't smart. You, you are, you obviously are. It's how you feel and the, the damage of comparison, right? The damage of comparison and competition. That's what I'm hearing from you. You know, that comparison of, yeah, that's right. You've got the sister and everyone probably has a sister or brother or a friend or whatever, who is the, the pretty one, the one who goes, yeah, that's right. The prom queen the one that everyone is attracted to the bee, beast honey kind of thing and then it's it's that instant oh well how do I compare to that because I envy it I love it I'd love to have that feeling of what that what that would bring um, even though many of those people are not happy I've also interviewed those people and they're like oh my gosh <laughs> Imagine if I wasn't this pretty face and I actually did get to learn who I was, you know, so there's, you know, never, there's always um, multiple sides to every, every facet. But I, I think, um, you know, that, that growing up in that world of comparison, and then obviously then, you know, when you're fearful, when you feel rejected, then you compete, right? You get up oh. your bat and you fight. And that's what a lot of that bullying stuff comes to. It's like, I need a sense of power. I need someone to see me, even 
bad Mm -hmm. behavior, negative attention is still attention, right? Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, see, that's the thing. Growing up in my household, we called the, I won't change my mom's name, the the Angie look. (laughs) Mm. Across that, I think the worst thing I ever said to my mother when I was growing up is, I can't wait to get out of this hole. Because my bedroom was in the basement. And it was, it was the whole basement, not the whole basement, but I'll, it was the largest room in the, in the house. Yeah. And imagine being in that large room and then being the only person there, just feeling like I can't even take up this space. Wow. I like, I can't even, I like this small little thing, this small little person and um, just feeling so insignificant. The Dalai Lama, I, I use, I use a lot of quotes actually. And I give reference when, when it's due. The Dalai Lama says, if you think you don't make a difference, try sleeping with the mosquito. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if that's not, I mean, thank Dalai Lama. It's so simple and so true. And it resonates that we all can make a difference in the world. And just one small, one small look mm. or one small look. Yeah. Can change someone's day, can change someone's life. Exactly. And it's, it's being in that space where are we able to hold that place for someone where they know that they matter. Yeah. Not, not that what they do, they we're human beings, we're not human doings. And I got wrapped up with that for about 30 years. I would say 25 good years. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't serve oneself well. It doesn't, didn't serve me well because I kept doing and going to college for 12 years, um, working on concurrent degrees at the same time because mm-hmm. I wanted to figure out my family. Why would I study family studies? I mean, read between the lines. And realizing that I'm not necessarily the, the identified patient. I'm the one who is identified only to the, to the extent of, and I, don't, I use this word very cautiously, the dysfunction in the family itself, because there's, there's, there's no functional family. Yeah. I, I, saw, I saw a cartoon once, it was a big auditorium, and there's two people in the audience, and, and there's a big banner over the stage, and it says, the annual conference of functional families. There's, there's not, there's no, I mean, no, it's only the Brady Bunch. It's only the, the, <laughs> right. The Brady Bunch is the second. We grew up with, right. We grew up with Brady Bunch and um, yeah. the world, you know, you're in the U S I'm in Australia. We all went, oh my gosh, imagine having a mum like that. Imagine having Alice doing all of our things. Imagine our siblings just being so lovely. And supportive. Uh, I and think I'll like go for a walk outside. Yeah, yeah. summer sun's caught. No, we're not singing joyful tunes with my siblings. We're fighting. We're pulling my hair. They're, <laughs> you're breathing on me. Stop breathing on me. That's not fun. So I mean, for, like, um, for example, this is a little bit before my time, but leave it to Beaver. I don't know yes. if you're- Yes, we you know that. June Cleaver had a set designer. <laughs> she wasn't making the meals. Yeah. And exactly. certainly wasn't saying yes word. Um, so anyway, that's uh, just, just for reference. It's, it's only with experience. And um, there's education, there's, there's schooling, the building, and then there's education, which is dictated by the legal system and the whole culture. And then there's knowledge, mm. which comes out of having experiences in the world. And then there's wisdom which comes from, and I, I, very few people that I know, I look at, wow, that's sage, Mm. that's sage wisdom, that's sage advice. Although I don't like the word advice, it's an A word or the should word, don't shit on me. The sage wisdom comes into place where, into play when the individual that I sense has integrated what they've learned and manifested, or I should say, trans, I beg your pardon, we have an extra guest. He consistently comes and visits when he knows I'm emoting. When I feel something, in, we have a beautiful. He always comes by. Have... <laughs> so this is a testament. This is a testament that I'm thoroughly engrossed in this content. And um, thank you for your listeners and, and audience for this. So he knows I'm feeling deeply about this this topic matter. I hope you don't mind. Um, sorry to any of our audience members who are fearful of cats. I beg your pardon. <laughs> So the individuals who I sense who have sage knowledge and wisdom are those who are able to transcend yeah. how it only resonates for themselves yeah. and then have it, not more, yeah. but make it relevant and uh, resonant to mm-hmm. those you know, universal truths, so to speak. Yes. That we all yeah. want to be loved. We all want to know that we matter. Yes. I think that's when you meet those people and, and I've had the pleasure of, of meeting many, you can just see the difference. The difference mm-hmm. is they, they own this, they own their truth and they, they have such 
confidence in their knowledge and understanding that has created true wisdom that they go, oh, I'm, I'm in my own zone. I'm, I'm happy. This, uh, this is my life. And you can take this gem and apply it to your own context. They realize that learnings can be applied to like infinite contexts, infinite yeah. situations across all you know, racial, religious, you know, um, all areas of diversity and definitely yes. gender that you actually go, oh, yeah, sure. It's not just for one person. It's not as if they've, they've got the golden ticket. They've actually right. just got a gem that they go, yeah, this, this, this applies to my life and it probably is going to apply to yours. But they don't yeah. compete with that. They don't go and say, you can't have it. Right. They just right. say, oh my gosh, like Dalai Lama is like going, oh, well, <laughs> this is just how I see it. Go, go right ahead and see what you think. Right. You, you can't hoard knowledge. I mean, you could. I mean, that's just narcissistic <laughs> in my personal behavior, opinion. I mean, you're going to hoard information. Okay. Wow. So the person who's on top, the person who's the winner, <clears throat> I certainly would not want to be winning because that's a really lonely place to be. <laughs> it's a very I would, <clears throat> number one. Maybe number one, only to the extent in my life so that I can be of service to others. Mm. So I have to love myself fully. And, and so there's certain folk, certain folk who, who, who want to love me until, mm. I, until I love myself and who see me in a way that I can't see myself. There's a sociologist from the early 1900s, an American sociologist. His name is Charles Horton Cooley. And he has a concept. It's not really a theory, so to speak. It's just a way that we... This is just a theory. So theories can't be proven. They can only be disproven. So if it resonates with you, great. If not, just take it for a grain of salt. And it, it is the, the, it, it, said, it said as follows. I am not what I think I am. Mm. I am not what you think I am. I, I am what I think you think I am. I'll say that again. We'll stop. I am not what I think I am. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my sense of self, my perception of me is not really, not really based on what I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm not what you think I am. It's not really based on what you actually think of me. Mm -hmm. I am what I think you think I am. Mm -hmm. So essentially my sense of self is conceptualized, understood, and then projected into the world based on what I think my perception of what you think of, of me, which could be totally skewed. <laughs> which is really not filtered. It's usually right. It's, it's totally, 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 not. totally skewed, right? The amount of people, yeah. including myself, for those that I've coached, who actually have these incredible narratives of what they think someone thinks of them. And I'm like going, why? Like, have you tested it? What What do you know about it? And also, who cares? Like, what I know, right? Right. So you're actually saying by that think that that thought that you're happy to let someone else's potential thoughts dictate your whole essence. Goosebumps. You are. <laughs> Goosebumps. Seriously, I'm you're dead straight on. Exactly. I mean, first of all, why am I going to let someone else's take great right, right take up space in my brain? Because they're not even thinking about me. I'm thinking. I'm thinking eight million. Say billion other people are thinking about me. I don't think so. I mean, that's a little egomaniac. Ego and I all. Um, maybe I got one little, little fur, fur baby who's thinking about me. That's, I'll, that's, a, that's enough for today. And uh, that's, that's all I got. That's fine. And at the same time, it is so little. It's so, it's so not belittling. It's such a little place to be to think that other people are actually thinking about me because that gives them the power. <laughs> I'm, I'm relinquishing my power over my sense of self. You made me feel this way. You made me do this. Really? I can't make her think they're, I cannot make you think, do, or say, or anything. And in fact, to, to assume that you have that power over me, why make yourself so small? So I claim the power, claim your power in your life and live. Long. I want people to be so full of themselves that they can't contain it, that it just <laughs> overflows and nourishes others from into their cup. It's the opposite, isn't it? I know, exactly. And, I, and all of it, I have experienced that. You know, even when I did a podcast and when I started doing business and life coaching, people, you know, you get suddenly then get some people go, oh, well, what are people going to think about you? Who, they'll think, who do you think you are? How do you have so much knowledge that you think yours is the best? What about other people? Couldn't they go to, you know, there's always someone better. And I, you kind of, you know, you can drown in this. You can get trolled when you're a public figure as well. And then you also you have to reach a stage and you go, you know, which is what I like. And I went, I don't care. If I don't have to be everyone's cup of tea. If they don't like me, just leave. Don't listen. Because once you let their their perspective rule you, oh, it's oh. 
it's so limiting, isn't it? It's it's completely limiting. That's the thing. I mean, oh, and this is this is just you're just dropping bombs on me. I'm like you're dropping gems here. Like the mic's going off the charts. This is nuts because and not not crazy nuts. It's amazing nuts. Because everything that years ago. I mean, just that the limiting beliefs that I had about what influence I had on the world and the fact that people aren't thinking about me all, all day. And that's a scary place to be also for someone who wants to be seen. Mm. For someone who's afraid to be seen in the world only because I fear rejection. What if they say no? What if I show up and they say no? Yeah, exactly. What if you don't get the approval that you're looking for? So I'm afraid to show up, but, and then coming into, don't, yes. And the judge, she sits, I call her Anna. She sits in the corner. She says, you're nothing. Who do you think you are? You're too, who do you're too big. And that we're, we're socialized. I mean, we're trained that way. Um, be nice, especially with, with girls, um, sugar and spice, everything nice. Um, um, go say yeah. you're sorry. Go say you're sorry. Uh, cross your legs. Don't take up too much space and certainly be quiet and demure. Mm. lace and popular so not feeling like you have a voice how often do you hear to a little girl and i'm not talk, talking about what we what we think maybe you know every day or maybe every week or something it's it's inundated every hour oh. we'll be strong look how strong you are laura wow that showed a lot of courage you're so brave, Big and brave. You, all, yes. you don't say that stuff to girls you say it to boys yeah <laughs> and how fearful it is to take up space. I mean, you don't see a lot of women just like on the, on the, you know, the bench with their legs sprung. You don't see that. No, you say not- you see them be be seen but not heard. Be pretty. Be yes. helpful. Be kind. Be caring. Let some grotty mm-hmm. uncle kiss you. Just accept whatever mm-hmm. you know. Um, limit yourself so that other people feel more comfortable, so that you can yes. serve them, and also you not just for your yourself, which is not recognized, so that you can make your family be proud. <laughs> wow! Oh wow, my goosebumps again. That's that's how I lived. I was uh, I was the I was doctor. My family calls me Lori, Doctor Lori. Uh, okay, that's what I've done. That's not who I am. And, and um, what did I do it for? Why, why did I do that? And I was afraid for so long to quit. I and mean, I was. What happened with me? People say, "Oh, you're extraordinary." I'm not extraordinary. I'm ordinary, and I make extraordinary choices on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. For someone to say that I'm extraordinary, that excludes them from being extraordinary. Yeah, that's a cop out. Exactly. To assume that I'm extraordinary, I'm extraordinary. That's the same spelling. It's the same exact word. The mm. punctuation is is a different place. Mm-hmm. So growing up, yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid to say, my brother is touching me in ways that you're not supposed to be. And do you know? Do you know? And even as an even as an adult going through rehab at an eating disorder clinic where I almost died, I was five pounds from death because I didn't want to show up, take up space. Mm-hmm. I wanted, I was imploding, and I was so big in my life. Nobody would know. Nobody knew because mm. I was afraid to be. Because all I had, I couldn't. I the silence was so quiet when I stopped, and I was just, I was a being. I couldn't be. I had to do, mm-hmm. and I was always moving, moving, moving. Because this believe it or not, is faster than this. And this is faster than this. Yeah. So if I sit with this, this is like, what? And I know I talk fast and I'm working on that always, every day. So to be with this always, 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 always. And having to, of my own volition, choosing to, to say, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to die. Like I saw it. And I was so sick. And I, I knew the behaviors I was engaging in and they were very, it was demonic. This is the word that I use. And asking my parents, I said, I need to know. You know, this is 30 years later. I have to know if they knew. Mm. And then worry, worrying about how is it going to possibly affect their relationship with my brother? Mm-hmm. I was worried as even as a grown adult, years of schooling, experience living in Europe, having these positions with the Pentagon. It doesn't matter. It's that little girl inside wondering about just, just ca- catering, just um, stifling myself, just so worried about how is it going to impact other people? And see, that's the interesting thing about empaths is that we genuinely care how others feel almost pretty much to the detriment of our own. 
hundred percent, hundred percent detriment. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, 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 at eight years old, I remember telling my stepmother that sometimes I feel so deeply it scares me because hmm. I didn't know what to do with those feelings. Hmm. I was the one in third grade who, believe it or not, throughout third grade, we were on a quarter system and we had number grades. And one of the, the subjects was listening. Hmm. Now, mind you, this, my, mind you, my area of in my industry and my, my position right now, my job, what, how I choose to define my, my role it's an avocation, not a vocation even, that um, I got, I failed listening throughout third grade. Now, mind you, in hindsight, this is like a revelation only came about two weeks ago that maybe it was about the teacher. And like, I was interested in what other people had to say. It wasn't, I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening to her hmm. and I wasn't keeping my mouth shut. Hmm. So that means it wasn't listening per se that I was graded on, it was talking. She hmm. was grading and talking. Hmm. So this is a difference that I'm just making. It's like it came out two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. I'm sitting there like, what? Yeah, that's what's going on. I got, I failed listening because I wasn't listening in a school, a school that's a building education. What I'm told of what I need to know, which is you shut up and you, you suit up and you shut up. Yeah. Listen to the teacher because the teacher's all powerful and all knowing like the professors that profess what they know, because they're all professing whatever. So we're dictated what we're, what we're supposed to learn. And then there comes the knowledge. Mm. Okay, I know that I changed my grade at the end of the third grade. I changed it from a three to a one. One would think I wasn't, I wasn't that smart because a two would be more reasonable because you did make the loop. I just did the white out and did the one. Um, took me, it takes me a minute sometimes. And so I sat, my parents found out and I sat the whole summer in my bedroom. I know, except for meals and bathroom. After oh. drinking a, a, a glass of dishwasher soap, I had to swallow it. I was burping for a while, bubbles. That oh said, gosh. now this is, this is, this is um, 40 years ago. I'm 48 yeah. now. So the whole summer, I'm, I failed listening to whom? Hmm. So I'm in the bedroom with myself for three months. Yeah. And it's, 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 I'm teary eyed because now I think about it. What would, how would I do? How would I, what's listening? Who am I listening to? See, that's my why. Yeah. People say, what's your why? What's your why? My why is an acronym is who hears you? W H Y. Who hears you? To whom are you speaking? Hmm. It's not what's your why. Not, not, it's not how, what's your how, what's your what, what's your who, what's your why? Who, who are you trying to speak to? Who do you want to speak? Who, who's your audience? Who do you want to hear what you have to say? Mm. Is it that little girl in the bedroom? Is that that little, is that that woman who's so big in her life and feels so small inside? That's the imposter syndrome. And I experience that a lot still today. Yeah. I think I, I, do. the power of the inner child uh, and the effects on your life are just mammoth. You know, it can take us decades to get over or just learn to live with and be aware of it and then still go, oh, I know this and now, now put it in its place. That takes <coughs> a long time for a lot of people. And look at for you, you know, that story that you just shared, Laura, you know, here you are at a time of, yeah, that's right. You've got to listen in a certain way in that construct because they've decided that school or that way of learning is the way that you have to. And if you don't conform with that, then you're a problem. Mm -hmm. Then you deserve punishment. So this girl who needs to be heard, who needs to be noticed, who needs to be validated the punishment because you don't fit in a box is mm. to then yeah drink soap spend time isolated talk about reinforcing uh, abandonment syndrome <laughs> you know like a sense of yeah. but then abandoned you're then given the opposite of what your inner child needs desperately you know mm. and that's right and then you say I know this even from even I've got five kids and just learning looking at their learning styles right you know you just go like one of them had ADD and was got told he wasn't smart because he was always looking out things, but he's a visual learner. He's actually super creative. So he just didn't yes. learn in the school system way, right? right. You're then always wrong, always in trouble, then probably, but not deliberately. It doesn't mean that you're yes. being a problem. It just means that you just don't hear or you don't relate or you learn in a different way. And, and therefore, problem for who? 
who's who's you've got, got the problem for the system because they've got exactly. kids in front of them and they just want you to learn in a certain way sure. right and you know who's imagine if we were like that in business and imagine if i was like that on my on boards that i sit on you know how does the how does the gold happen with the diversity with the breadth of I love it when I've got people who are so random, but they put in these really unusual thoughts and you kind of go, yeah, like. And goosebumps then, again, you're dropping these, but yes, the vision, I got goosebumps, literally I'm freezing. The, my cat's gonna, he's freaking out. The, the visionaries, the creatives. Yeah. Those are the, bite me, uh, he wants me to come the back people to who change the world. The people who yes. change the world are not the 30 kids who are just doing exactly what the professor professes and becoming, being good. You know, nothing wrong with that. Some people are just the the small percentage of the rote learn and, you know, you do it, you go to university, you succeed. I'm not saying that that can't be possible, but most innovators, most people who've gone left field and just went, oh man, I've got this crazy idea and I'm going to back myself are actually the people who were not in that construct. They were the people who the Richard Branson's, you know. The, or Albert Einstein. Who go and say, I'm just going to dwell with these thoughts and I'm just going to go, right. Who's, who said it's not possible? You know, right. It's the thing. What's impossible? Impossible is I'm possible. Yeah. Everything's it's not impossible. impossible. It, it's the same word. It's the same letters. Yeah, exactly. It should, if you change the things, if you change the way you look at the world, the world that you look at changes. Excuse me. So, you know, I mean, I'm not being rude. I love you. Um, 100%. I was talking to him. I was talking to my cat. Um, it just, it just a, it's a mindset shift. Yeah. I'm not the problem. If someone's got a problem with me, who's got the problem? Yeah, exactly. So then what do we, what do, we do with that? How do we then navigate the, our show up in our lives? How do we navigate the world in a way that, not conformity per se, and I don't mean that, we, that we're necessarily, I don't mean that we have need to be, not that necessarily that we need to be respected, just even just heard mm. so that we can step into the door so that we're not looked at as, as um, Outliers is okay. Freaks, that's another thing. Because sometimes freaks aren't listened to. But I'll tell you, I'll be sure. You know that picture of Albert Einstein where he's got the, the hair. And he, I mean. Pretty freaky. <laughs> pretty freaky. But that's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm. So now that I know better, I can do better. But how do we navigate the system and work with it as opposed to anarchy? Yeah. And just. Okay. just yeah. I think for me, I, I, I try to be passionate about, you know, everyone has the opportunity to be their best self and to be who they were designed to be, born to be, think the way they do, be as creative as you want to be, you know, be interested in, in things. All you want to have is the opportunity to be, to be heard and have a place at the table. Everyone doesn't have to agree with that, relate to that, own that. And if they don't, that's not also a problem. That just means that they're in a different they're in a different area. You know, they've got different needs. As as you want to respect them to own that space, right? It's it's Absolutely. incredible that that is a revelation. You know, once you actually get to that stage and go, like, even if if I'm if I'm in my zone and I'm just doing my thing, and all I want is the opportunity to be able to do that to the best of my ability and to have the biggest impact for myself and for the planet, yes. and everything else. But all all these other people, if it doesn't suit that's okay you know we but we need to actually do that switch off of going that's okay but that doesn't have to limit me i actually just i'm, I'm okay with you not being okay with me or what i believe in that's the difference because that stops you from then you know then going oh okay how do i have to conform to get their approval oh. you don't need everyone's approval right and the tricky oh. thing is for women who've had journeys like us and those who know me have i've had a similar journey um in you know childhood um, abuse and things like that it, it's that um it's the it's the power of the family or the social norms, right? It's the power of yes. you. You could do that, you know, you could do what Annie's saying or Laura's saying in, you know, in work or with certain friend circles or whatever. But what if it's family? You know, so that's that then changes everything because then you're the bad one. You're the one who wrecks things. Like when you said, well, what if what right. parents think? Because you're still this girly inner child. I want to make sure that. I don't upset the family system and I don't want, how's that going to affect their relationship with an abuser? Um, right. Also, another key gem that I related to when you shared before is what if you're at the ends of your tether, you know, like you were in an acute situation with eating disorder. I had an eating disorder as a result as well. Common theme, ladies. Um, but what your inner fear is, but what if they haven't noticed, they haven't asked, they obviously haven't cared. Then oh, yeah. the next step for me was, 
what if I tell and they still don't care? Okay. That for me is like, that's that was the guts of it because mm. that's a hard thing to live with. And for me, my journey was that I had to live with that and then eventually you get to a stage and go, that's okay, that's their choice, that's their decision. Right. It doesn't have to own you. Gosh, gosh, that's, that's uh, I, had, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't have that experience. Mm. I hear it though. I really hear it. Mine was so, so obvious. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, I was everything, everything, uh, the whole gamut. I was all of it. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want to go into, I don't want to go into details yeah. or trigger, um, that's a whole different, different, and I, I can for sure. I don't, I'm not shy. I don't shy away from that. It's just not appropriate at this moment that, um, yes. And it's the same thing with abuse that goes on in the family is especially when it happens with a family member. Yes. What yes. if I say this family member is touching me in areas that I don't know what this means. And then, and then if you know what it means, you come to a realization like what that, what, wait a second. And then you say something or you never say anything. Mm -hmm. And then it hinders not only your relationship with your family members, but every subsequent relationship yes. that you have in yes. your life. And there's this code of silence. Mm -hmm. And I think, right. I mean, it's, it's becoming so much more common for women now. What about the men? Mm. It's so common among men. I studied ma um, masculinity mostly for my dissertation. I, I um, worked on my doctorate. My, my dissertation was the subjective experiences of at-home dads. Mm. I wanted to study men from a feminist perspective in order to highlight and put women's career trajectory on the forefront of um, the alert uh, of people's awareness. Only to, and this is 20 years ago, only to the extent of, I'm not a big fan. I'm a feminist, but not a big fan of saying, you got to do this, man. You got to put yeah. women first. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that because that doesn't work hmm. from my perspective. How about a different, it's just a mind shift. It's just a, a shift. It's just a little like, huh. Honoring up and awarding, not awarding, honoring up and allowing a platform for men to speak and for alternative ways of being where they take over. Not, they don't turn. Those are not the words that I intended to use. We allow a space for men to engage in relationships and their space in the world so that it is alternative, different than what's the norm. And that leaves open the space for women to then move forward in their career, career trajectory. Now that's not to say that there isn't a bunch of navigation and communication and, and to go do with that. So, but then at the same time, what if a woman or a young girl wants to speak out and does something different? Hmm. And the men who are coming forward now, I've been hearing so, I don't know if that's like, because I'm putting my doctoral work from 20 years ago out there in the world, they're coming to me and they're saying, we're hurting. Hmm. You know, I, I need to talk about this now because it's not just within the family, it's in the, with the clergy and it's the teachers and it's the coaches and, and there's so many, it's their, their colleagues. Yeah. Their coworkers. Yeah. And the scary thing about it is that there's this pejorative, misogynistic, verbiage that people use you're a pussy are you gonna cry now you little girl so mm. then there's the connotation that anything is feminine is weak mm. and then any any opportunity that men want to express their feminine side now i don't mean to like like they're different they're just they're you know exclusionary more of a feminine group presentation of themselves that it's ridiculed and it's hindered and interestingly enough it's not just the men who do it to other men. Sometimes it's the women in their lives who do it because they don't, they're not showing up as the men that they expected them to be. Mm. Then yeah. men, cowed, they cower back and they, they hold that in. And I don't want to make this, you know, necessarily, I know this is about women. At the same time, it is about women. Mm. It is about women. What, where are we holding the men in, a, in our space? Are we honoring the men to show up for us in the same way that we want to be held? Yeah, exactly. If we want to emote, if we want to be respected, because I cry a lot and I'm not, I don't, I'm not afraid of that anymore. I, I love my feelings. I lean into them. I don't shy away from them. I'm like, people are like, oh, don't cry. I need to cry right now because yeah. I know that when I lean into it, I'll get through it. Hmm. It doesn't scare me because it won't, it does not kill me. Feelings are not fact. Hmm. They're just feelings. They don't define me. Hmm. Only to the extent that I know that I can emote and be okay and love so much more thoroughly because I know my, crying out of pain and hurt and fear is indicative of how deeply I love and live mm. and laugh. Mm. So anyway, got a little time to there.
if we hold space for everyone, then we hold space for everyone. If we hold space for no one and we sit in fear and silence, then who's going to listen when we stand and speak? Yeah. 100%. 100%. So you as a feminist leader in this space, how do you encourage those who are all about women's empowerment and, and progressing their, their cause to be, be, you know, to show up, to step up, to stand out, to own their own space? How do you encourage them to take those next steps inclusive of the men uh, in this world? The only way I know how, and as uh, hopefully as, as part of this conversation, that I know a little bit about a lot, and I know a lot about a very little bit. <laughs> so the only way that I know a lot about is in the very small life that I have, in that be a voice for those. I mean, now, granted, there are a lot of women who I know that say, you can't speak about men, or it's not okay to speak about men, that we're feminists, and we have to stay within our own femaleness for me that's not inclusionary no it's just me, anti-male it's just yeah, I mean, i'm not anti -male. Well, it's kind of like well that's anti-male that's not feminism feminism mm -hmm. is about equality and yeah. um, and working together with our unique differences and complementary mm -hmm. sort of traits if you like if i'm anti-male then i'm anti half the population of the world i got i got here um and yeah. how am i possibly going to we don't need men to live. We know uh, well, eventually over time, then the population eventually is not going to, I'm not in my lifetime, but eventually. And so how is that inclusionary? How is it inclusive? How, how am I respecting diversity? Yeah. Where's the balance? Um, yeah. So um, if there, the, there's a movement, I don't know to what extent in Australia, there's a huge movement in the United States now about um, diversity and inclusion. Okay. Yeah. So we need to encourage and incorporate those who are not of the same skin color. Mm -hmm. who has been in the majority, the, 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 the powerful, that, I mean, I, I, that's one other conversation, that um, I need and want to have men in my life. Yeah. I have a, I have a ma masculine sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. I'm very assertive. I'm not, I try as well as I can not to be aggressive. You hurt my family member, I'm coming after the jugular. <laughs> you hurt someone I, I care about, I mean, it's going to be right here at the same time. And that's masculine. Mm -hmm. That's me presenting there, there's aggression there. Mm -hmm. So I own that. At the same time, I'm the first one to be, if someone's, I mean, I'm like, well, I mean, you know what I mean? Come on. So I don't, that's the thing. People, this is masculine and feminine. It's a continuum. Exactly. So step into your continuum. Step into your, it's not polar opposites. It's not me against you. It's not us against them. It's exactly. me. It's called the you. Yeah. It's called the universe. Una, one, verse, song. Universe, one song. Wow. We're in harmony together. 100%. And if someone is fighting, think about if they're fighting you. I got all this cat here now. Right? This I just love this so much. <laughs> if someone's fighting you and they're you're fighting you, imagine what's going on within themselves. Yeah. They're not fighting you. <laughs> they're fighting being scared of, of being rejected themselves. Exactly. And that's a terrible way to live. It's the way you were feeling when you were a child and, and you felt threatened and unloved and unnoticed and you become a bully. And so that's exactly it, you know? Yes. <laughs> You're dropping the mics here, hon. Yeah. There's no other way to be in the world, at least how I know it. And please enlighten me because I'm, I, some, I got these out of glasses on now, but sometimes I'm clueless. I really, I don't know that much. I just know only people because I've been presented with individuals like yourselves who impart onto me your wisdom from your experience. Hmm. So help me understand. And if, I, if I'm not getting it, sometimes there's a point where you got to agree to disagree. Because hmm. if, if I start to feel within me, I don't like how I feel about myself when I'm interacting with you, not you, with someone. If I don't like how I feel about myself, then, and I, um, because I'm, I'm starting to, can, you know, define or come up with all these um, words that should not be spoken in, in public about your character. First of all, those are not true. I'm just frustrated with me because like, you're not doing what I want you to do or you're not saying what I want you to say. And then I need to separate myself only, I give myself a timeout. Like with our, my children, you know, you, you teach people, you train our, we train our kids. 
Mm. It's, not a, it's not parenting. It's just like anything. You train them. So for me, what's worked is time out. I can't be around you right now because I don't like how I feel about myself in this moment. It has nothing to do with them because it brings up all my stuff from childhood. Yeah. Because you're saying stuff that I disagree with. Why do I disagree with it? How are my, my ideologies? How is my perceptions or perspective of the world defined? Then I got to start thinking it takes so much work. It's a pain in it. Ours really because oh. it's like oh, yeah. I hate it. It's the same. I love it because I have insight. The thing about insight, though, analysis is paralysis. Insight is great. What are you gonna do with it? There's three <laughs> frogs on a lawn. Three frogs on a lawn. Two decide to jump off. How many are left? <laughs> three. They didn't jump off. They decided to. Insight is great. Yeah. What are you gonna do with it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. I love talking to you. Laura, we could just talk all day long. Oh my gosh, we're so on the same page in so many areas. And I just know your wisdom in in these so, these other fields is just insane. I, and, uh, I'll be honest with you. I did my research on it because I'm like, oh my God, I'm talking to Annie. I did my research. I'm like going to do, doing convoy. I'm doing so he's gonna bite me now. I'm doing recon going, I got, I'm going to go to your website because I'm all feeling imposter syndrome. Cause I'm like, oh my God, she's done this. She's got an academy, she's got all these women following her. I'm like, I got no, I got a cat. I got nothing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But sweetheart, it's not a competition, right? That's I know exactly you're right. It. That's what that's I love. So I just go, and that's why I have this podcast and my global community and my academy and all this. It's like, oh my gosh, girls, that's right. This is a whole new new world. This is the future that we want for our, our daughters and our sons uh, to inherit that everyone is enough in their own self. Mm. Everyone is enough by just being, it's about working out how you tick, who you are, and just maxing out and loving on that while- yes while supporting other people to do exactly the same thing despite you know that's right gender despite race despite religious preference despite where you live in the globe you know right. there's enough and and those alpha traits those masculine and feminine yeah. traits you know like we'll all have them i love what you said there about it's a continuum because you know i'll do that i you know i'm a ceo of a, uh, in australia of, of a couple of businesses and i'll get on stage and i'll go and i've had men come up to me goes well you're so alpha alpha male you know you're just strong oh. and demanding and i'm like i'm just a kid yeah. speaker yeah i'm owning yeah, this space that. and yes right. the authority so it comes out and then the next bit, what am I known for in my academy? It's like, oh my gosh, Annie's so mumsy and caring and kind and will cry with me and stuff. And you go, yeah, we're all on a continuum. And some of us will bend to one side or the other or an even flow. Or sometimes you just have the highs and lows and go, oh my gosh, how can I be so strong in this way one day and a basket case the next? It's normal. I know, I know. <laughs> it's crazy. I know like the whole business thing. I don't know business well. I know content. I know my, but I'm like, what's a business strategy? Yeah. Margaret, I don't know what a funnel is. I don't know. I mean, I can work with my clients. You want me to hold space with you? Yeah. That's definite. But, that's I not even but you know how to do, see, that's the thing. This is the comparison thing. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to stifle part of what I'm going to say only to the extent that I know it's not helpful, especially for the audience. I see women like you, like you, who seem to have it all together. I don't know what, you got something. I don't know what it is. Everybody's got something. I'm not asking you to tell me, you, we could talk offline if you need some help. But uh, at the same time, anybody who's listening to this right now, you got something. And somebody else has that something too. Maybe yeah. it's something that I said, maybe it's something that Annie said, you got something. And I implore you, whatever happens, there's someone who's gonna say me too. You're not alone. Hmm. no matter what there's 8 billion people in the world you're not alone hmm. you might feel lonely but you're not you're, you matter and I pray I hope I'm not a religious person I do believe that there is something out there that has resonated with someone based on this beautiful person Annie who's amazing who's offered this this platform because I'm not speaking right now. Hmm. Annie's listeners are speaking right now through me. I'm just a conduit. Hmm. So, beautiful. Be 
Beautiful said. How do people find you though, Laura? They all know how to find me at AnnieGibbons.com. How do they find you? How do they reach out to you? If so, what you've said today and the way you approach life and the areas that you are an expert in, how do they reach out and find you? LinkedIn is the best place for me to be. Yeah. And a clubhouse for sure. Uh, it's just LinkedIn is the preference. And then Dr. Laura Cobb, D-R-L-A-U-R-A-C-O-B-B is the best. Or Laura at Dr. Laura com. My website is under construction right now, so I beg your pardon. <laughs> hey, we're all in there. So is mine. I'm, I'm in the process of growing. One launching in. I love it. I, I said one week about a month ago, so it's still a week, a week, a week. You know, that's life, isn't it? We all yes. things happen. You know, you always get a bit overly ambitious, but that's okay. We're all in a work in progress, and I love that. I think we should all be yeah. always in a work in progress. I will leave all of your details on my podcast platform, also on my YouTube channel. Everyone, I encourage you, you know, that's right. These these millions of people globally, there's always someone who resonates with you. You know, reach out to Dr. Laura. Uh, if, if what she said resonates with you, you just love her style, you just you're just attracted to her there's something about her that goes she's my kind of girl uh you know obviously you all love reaching out to me and i just so honor uh that's that space and i encourage you to always to stay close and also ladies just just you know if you are in that lonely place if you are in that bedroom or you feel like that inner child even if you're 30, 40, 50, 60, it's never too late just to step out and join a tribe. You know, there are women out there, definitely in my academy and others around the world. I've had so many speakers all around the place that I don't care where you find your tribe. I just want you to find it. I want you to believe mm -hmm. that there is someone, if you're not getting heard by your community, just reach out into, and it's really easy. You just make that call, just do a DM and go, I need that. I need well, a create your own. And then create your own create tribe. Create your own. Exactly. There you go, boom, boom. Take Annie's leap. She did her own. She did her own. Create your own tribe. Cry, 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 tribe. Sometimes it's a crime when you don't create your own tribe, but create your own. Create your own. Do your own thing. You know what? And then when you're claiming that, others will find you. Other people will admire you. Other people will support you. They'll keep you accountable. They'll be your best cheerleader. You know, and that's where the magic happens. That's where the innovation, transformation, power plays happen and and also the everydays happen that you're just on your couch feeling feeling happy feeling loved right uh that's what it's all about you don't always have to be a power machine every single day you know that's gloss and bubbles you know uh it's actually just that in uh in a child just goes yes i feel successfully on my own terms i feel balanced in the way i live and i actually just feel happy Mm. deep down happiness and joy is my closing statements for today so thank you for being on my program laura thank you thank you thank you you are a blessing and this has been a lesson and i just want to put you in a ball in my back pocket and carry you around all day because you're amazing thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> to repeat thanks so much for listening to this episode of memoirs of successful women you can find me at anniegibbons.com where you can download my free resources, get connected on social and check out my online magic transformation program. If you love this show, feel free to subscribe to future episodes and of course, share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon and until then, happy podcasting.